Good morning once again and welcome to the JKMNR, JKMRC Friday seminar series on behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute. We'd like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Yagata people as the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections with country and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Peter Knights and Dr Mike, Mike and Erring today. Peter is currently the discipline leader for mining within for, for mining within the School of Mechanical and Mining Engineering at UQ. He has over 30 years of experience in applied mining research and has conducted numerous research projects with mining companies in Australia, Canada, and Chile. He has a deep understanding of mine planning processes, having co-authored several papers related to mine scheduling, and have, having taught numerous surface and underground mine planning courses to mining engineers. Peter was leader for the Smart Mining Systems Program and CRC Mining from 2005 to, to uh, 2014, as well as the Executive Director of Mining Education Australia from 2010 to 2012. Micah is a uh, lecturer within the School of Mechanical and Mining Engineering at uh, UQ. He leads the Mine Production Optimization and Scheduling Group, which is heavily focused on delivering high quality research outcomes, such as mine planning, considering pre-concentration systems and planning and installation of in-pit uh, crusher conveyor systems. Micah has research collaborations with uni universities in Sweden, Germany, Kazakhstan, and has also developed an industry network that works with him in the implementation of some of his group's research outcomes. The title of their talk today is Mine Design for ESG, a Systems Engineering Approach. Please join me in welcoming Peter and Micah. So thank you very much, uh, Tom, for that introduction and for the um, opportunity to present here. So uh, this is a, a, a presentation that um, we've added to since the World Mining Congress. So we've, um, we've given a similar presentation there. Um, so it's titled Mind Design for ESG, um, and it's a, a research roadmap to incorporate ESG into um, early stage mine, mine design. Um, I'd just also like to acknowledge uh, Eric and Byron from Mining3, who were particularly useful when it came to the uh, case study. So, um, so this research will also hopefully find a new home now in the Copper for Tomorrow CRC, um, which, uh, which we're hoping for a positive outcome on. All right. Okay. So the um, the real novelty of this project is that we're using a systems engineering approach to um, in in quality functional deployment or QFD to um, as an approach to systematically incorporate um, ESG aspects into early stage mine design and, and planning. So it's different from other studies that simply take the viewpoint of perhaps um, a purely a social scientific viewpoint or, a, or an environmental viewpoint. Uh, so this allows us to incorporate all the E, S and G aspects from an engineering uh, viewpoint. So it's, it's, um, it takes a totalistic approach. Um, this is by no means the only approach to incorporate ESG into the mine design and planning process. It's, it's just one way. Um, and uh, what it does, it provides a, a line of sight. So uh, we're by no means suggesting also that we do away with site management plans. Um, this provides the framework for site management plans to hang off this framework. So systems engineering, what, what is it? Um, Peter will go into further elaboration later on, but essentially it's an interdisciplinary field of engineering and engineering management that focuses on how to design, integrate and manage complex systems over their life cycle. Uh, and so mining projects are usually characterized by a series of um, expansion phases. So um, if we take our diagram there on the right, we've got uh, cost or capex along our x axis and value up, up along the y axis. And as we progress from, from phase to phase, we usually get a, a diminishing uh, return on our, on our capital. Uh, and so there are, there are two factors that, that tend to destroy uh, value. Um, this is economic value. They're usually capex overruns 
and also delays in project approval and delivery. And so um, the root cause often for those delays is often ESG related. So um, while we can often handle technical risks into the planning process through incorporation into the block model, it's often far more difficult to handle uh, ESG risks. So ESG externalities can be difficult to manage. Um, those risks are not easily valued and public sentiment is often difficult to predict and can change rapidly. So we saw an example of that uh, not too long ago with the Australian bushfires uh, and the concern related to that with, um, with um, respect to climate change. So this diagram is from the um, NASA Systems Engi Engineering Handbook. Um, and what it shows is that 75% uh, of a product's life cycle uh, risks or, and, and therefore costs are generally committed very early on in the, um, in the concept and design phase of a project. And so by analogy, 75% of a mining's project's environmental and social risks are also locked in uh, in the early conceptual and, and, and pre-feasibility stage as well. So, um, however, we can, we can minimize those ESG risks um, and enhance opportunities if we design for them um, early, as early as possible in the mine design uh, process. So this diagram um, re-emphasizes that, that fact that um, uh, a lot of these big decisions need to be made up front at the concept um, scoping or pre-feasibility stage. Um, and these usually then present as order of magnitudes, magnitude outcomes later on as we progress through this project investment decision process. So the, um, the scope of this uh, particular project um, was to identify some open source contributions um, that address building sustainability into the early stage mine design, uh, to identify ESG factors that cannot simply be quantified and incorporated into the block model of a mine, to uh, investigate and recommend a, a suitable framework for managing ESG factors throughout the life of mine, to demonstrate this, this framework via a case study. Uh, and then finally, to recommend a suite of research projects that are designed to close the gap required to incorporate ESG factors into early stage mine design. And so one of the, um, the key literature items we came across was, um, was this study by De Beers. Um, and they essentially present a four step process um, for their sustainable sustainability valuation approach. Step one is to understand the project contents, context. So um, identifying key sustainability challenges and opportunities, identifying key project decisions. So going through a, a, a discovery and characterization phase. And so as part of that, um, they've listed their, their environmental and societal um, sustainability value drivers. So from the societal perspective, there's land stewardship, safety and health and license to operate. The next step then goes on to generating options for key project decisions. Okay, so um, identifying sustainability risks and opportunities then for each of those options. Step three is then to analyze options and determine um, the value that is at, at stake. So defining various scenarios for each option, defining assumptions to quantify the sustainability value at stake for each scenario and so forth. Um, and then step four is to uh, finally recommend a preferred option or, or, or options based on, on those previous steps. Uh, there's also the um, BHP, Social Value Capital Decision Evaluation Model. Um, and so this might be a little bit difficult to see as well, but essentially we've got three steps in this case, understanding, analyzing, deciding. 
Um, the BHP uses seven stakeholders. So up along that left-hand side there, we have environment, indigenous peoples, uh, the workforce, local communities, customers, suppliers, uh, and then finally shareholders. And then mapped against each of those seven stakeholders are their primary uh, value drivers. So that's, that's trying to understand it, going through a process of discovery and characterization. The next step that BHP takes is an anal analysis phase. So where they're trying to um, analyze on a, on a multi-factor evaluation process to compare different project um, development alternatives. So in, that, in this case, they've, they've shown projects A and B or, or scenarios A and B there, um, taken the, the main stakeholders, their main value drivers, and then plotted from highest to lowest where um, each of those uh, alternatives sit with respect to, to each, to each um, value driver. And then finally, um, they make a decision. So uh, that involves deciding on whether or not to pursue a project um, and how that ultimately contributes to a, a company's strategic um, social value objective and the contribution that it, this project makes towards achieving that objective. So we... Um, we propose that there exists a, a major gap um, in that model, which sits between um, step one and step two in this case, step one being the understanding phase, step two the um, analysis phase. Um, and that gap relates to a detailed scenario analysis um, around project alternatives relating to key mine design levers. So key decisions that we make as part of the mine planning and design process. So things such as cut, uh, process route, the scale of operation, the mining method we're selecting, um, the, the sequence and scheduling, as well as then the cutoff grade policy. Uh, and so uh, that's important for understanding um, uh, how, to, um, how to measure and quantify the risks and opportunities at the project level with each with each change in lever. So if we get a change in process route, we, we, we need to be able to understand how that changes the uh, ESG risks and opportunities associated with that particular lever or decision variable. Um, so it, it, it's that level of granularity that we, that, that we need um, at the strategic mine planning phase to properly incorporate those ESG risks and opportunities. Uh, and that step should also identify um, go and no-go risks. Uh, it should also identify risks that can be treated as constraints, risks that can form part of an objective function. Uh, and also you'll have the life of mine versus tactical trade-off in there as well, where if you take dusk for, for example, you can, you can uh, on an operational level, you can mitigate dust through various suppression means, or you can design for that at a strategic level um, by uh, through your waste dump design and so forth. So while our previously reviewed codes of practice um, and guidelines and frameworks provide a high level approach, they don't go to the level of granularity that we need, and they don't propose a structured methodology for incorporating these decisions. Um, related to the mine planning and design process. So that's what this particular project proposes to do, is designing a, a roadmap for the inclusion of ESG into the mine planning process and trying to identify the key missing parts that we don't yet um, have in order to be able to do that. So another study by um, Davies and Franks um, examined the publicly available literature and conducted some interviews. I think there was 50, 50 cases all up. Um, and this figure shows that the result of those cases. So uh, it's looking at, at conflicts. Um, so uh, proximate, proximate um, issues that were, um, that were related to those parties to conflicts presented as central issues and they were mainly environmentally themed. So we have their, um, we have pollution um, closely followed by the distribution of benefits, um, competition for resources, so water, 
and then there's consultation and communication. Uh, however, the most common underlying issue for those that were that contribute to the state of the relationship between parties while not necessarily precipitating conflict were predominantly social and economic in nature. So, um, and then a secondary finding was that um, projects that were at the, at the study and pre-feasibility construction phases were the most overrepresented in this study. Uh, and that was uh, as a result of communities experiencing a, a, a new influx of people um, as a result of that project um, starting up. So if we look at the, the mine planning process, um, this is, I guess, if you were to to model it, try and model it as a linear version, it's not linear, it's very iterative, obviously, but to give us the, the, the line of sight, um, this is how you how you might go about it. You'd start, obviously, with your, your raw body that goes into your resource model. You, you, you look at process route selection, scale of operation, um, going into mining method, you look at end of life pathways, select your fleet, um, design your mine, uh, plan out that mine, do some cutoff optimization, uh, set out your sequence and schedule, uh, and, and then finally um, iterate to uh, multiple times to to optimize that that process. So that's um that's the mine planning process if you were to model it as a as a linear version. Um, another. Another nice model um, presented by Cummis uh, is this one, where we have our six central levers or decisions as part of the key, as part of the, the mine planning process. And those central six levers uh, we have control over. And they form the majority of the value that emanates from your mine plan. So we have control over the process route that we select, the scale of operation, the mining method, the sequence, the cutoff grade, uh, and finally the end of life pathway. And feeding into that then are a series of uh, input models that we have little or no control over. So our geography, our geological model, geotech, geomet, geoenvironmental, hydrological, metallurgical, geopolitical, our market models, um, and our social impact assessments, they, they feed into that um, to ultimately generate our, our mind plan. So it's those six key central uh, levers that we need to focus on uh, as part of not only creating value, economic value, but also social and environmental value and impact. And so in... Um, developing that concept further, if we take those six um, key levers for value creation as part of the strategic mine planning process, then our first three, process root scale and mining method, tend to represent the overall cumulative impact that we're going to have. So modeled on a, on a logarithmic log uh, cumulative impact scale there. Um, then through some smart sequencing, perhaps, and some smart cutoff grade policy, we can we can re reduce that impact. Perhaps we can um, schedule our waste so that we we uh, reduce the the vertical um, haulage distance, or we uh, do some modelling around cutoff policy to include some geomet parameters um, such as hardness and or silica or arsenic content to bring that back. Um, but that. Um, um, shows the um, value or uh, proposes the value that each of those levers could potentially be uh, contributing. And so if we, if we take BHP's seven um, key stakeholders, we've added an eighth being government, government there. So we, we now have environment, indigenous peoples, uh, workforce, local communities, customers, suppliers, government and shareholders. We've also taken BHP's um, value drivers for each of those stakeholders and added some, and, and no doubt, given the context, there may be more to add. Um, but using that as a starting point, we then um, we then use this is a, a flow sheet or a flow map of what we've how we've gone about identifying those aspects that are quantifiable 
and able to be incorporated into the block model, those that are quantifiable and not able to be incorporated into the block model, those that are not quantifiable and not able to be incorporated into a, a block model. So we start with our eight key stakeholders, our 31 um, stakeholder values, and then we map that against each of our six uh, key levers for value creation as part of the strategic mind planning process. So we've got our we've got our thirty one um, value drivers there, um, and it might be hard to see, but we map out for each of those six key levers the likelihood and impact that that value driver um, is going to have on that particular lever. Okay, then whether that um, um, value driver is able to be incorporated into the block model from a process route perspective and uh, oh, sorry, whether it's quantifiable, first of all, and whether that's able to be incorporated into um, a block model. And so we've mapped that out for each of those 31 value drivers against each of those six key levers uh, to ultimately show that our our variables that are quantifiable and not able to be incorporated into the block model are largely S and G variables, which is to be expected, I guess, um, with the with the um, exception of perhaps air quality, which is an E variable. Um, we're able to quantify it, but not necessarily incorporate it into a block model just yet. But our our other variables include occupational health and well-being, career development and training, human rights and governance, livelihoods community education, community health and safety, uh, and so forth. And then we have um, a more difficult, uh, 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 an another set of variables that are more difficult to quantify and are not able to be incorporated into the block model. And so these are S variables. So resettlement, um, employee engagement and corporate culture, meaningful, inclusive participation, and finally, product stewardship um, and trust. So, so I'll hand over to Peter to continue that presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Micah. So following on from, from that, we looked around at uh, possible frameworks for representing the complexity of the decisions that we were trying to, to model. Um, from the systems engineering um, textbooks, we came across something called quality function deployment. It's also known as the house of quality. Um, it was first developed by the Japanese in um, the late 1960s, early 1970s. So um, the first recorded use was by Mitsubishi in their heavy shipbuilding industry in Japan, and it was developed as a tool for uh, transferring customer needs into quality requirements in a product. Um, so essentially, um, looks quite quite ferocious, but let me explain it on here. So essentially, uh, this first section here in the quality function deployment looks at customer quality needs. Um, in our um, perspective, we could look at the stakeholder value requirements here. So that's our y-axis through here. The second part comes down in prioritizing those. Not all of those values are equal. Okay, So there is a, a decision-making process that goes through and says, of these, which ones are my critical stakeholder values that we really need to have line of sight over through a, a project? We then match those to a set of technical solutions, which is our x-axis across there. Um, so that might be something around, what's my mining method? Are we looking at underground? Are we looking at surface? Uh, if we go underground, uh, are we looking at block caving? Are we looking at some other form of operation? What are the, the limitations in through here? Um, so essentially these are our, our major technical solutions and, and Mike can mention those around um, the, the six key variables that we need to look at. The middle part of the matrix there looks at an impact assessment. It essentially uh, asks, okay, so for example, if we select block caving in here, how well does it match the stakeholder concerns? 
Um, and so there is a, a decision making that goes through here. Um, in the way that, that quality function deployment works, uh, essentially you're using an index to represent that. But we see this as an area that requires further research to, to assess the degree of fit of certain technical solutions with the stakeholder concerns. Um, at the top up here, uh, after looking at these key design variables, essentially this um, row here is, is actually giving us some indication as to whether we're trying to maximise or minimise the, the variable or whether it should be part of the optimization function. So is it a constraint or is it part of the overall objective function here? So that's going some way to, to trying to identify how to treat each of these variables. Um, across on the, uh, the far uh, right-hand side, we have a degree of fit. So uh, if you like, this is one configuration of what the mine might look like. We can go across here and look at how well these collective design decisions are satisfying each one of the stakeholder concerns. And we can map that. So that's what that line is doing through here. Um, and you can compare it to uh, alternative design scenarios. Uh, down the bottom, uh, again, you do this vertically and you can look at how well a technical solution satisfies the collective stakeholder concern. So, for example, if I select a vertical roll mill uh, on the, 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 the mine as a plant, how well is it satisfying some of these stakeholder objectives? And I get an indication here as to how critical that is, that particular design and decision is to satisfying the overall stakeholder concerns. At the top, this is the house. This is where the house of quality gets its name. And this is why we've also named this the house of ESG. Okay. So what this is displaying are the trade-offs that you need to make. So in any design process, there are always trade-offs. Um, and essentially, this is saying that if we choose a vertical roll mill in here, what other elements do we need to trade off in our mine design? We might need uh, a finer crushing uh, a finer um, blasting solution, for example, out of, out of the mine. So uh, the, the, there is an indication as to whether there's a positive or negative trade-off going on with your design decisions here. So that's the essence of what the house of, of ESG is. Um, we um, looked at, for, so when we look at the, the voice of customer, there were 31 stakeholder values in there. What we found when we tried to apply this in practice was the matrix rapidly grows out of control. So you end up with a very large design matrix, okay? And it means that you have to concentrate on what are the, the critical variables to the mine design. So this is one way to do it. You can look at the, the stakeholders. We've listed 31 different values. We can, uh, if we want to, design to specific metrics that represent each of those, those values. So that's what you might do in a, in a very complex system and you would need some sort of computerized system to, to help you with that. On the technical solutions, we were inspired by another systems engineering tool, which is called SIPOC, which stands for suppliers, input process, outputs and customers in there. So essentially what you're looking at is here are your inbound logistics, the inputs into any mining process. Here are your outputs of the mining process. So obviously, concentrate, tailings, wastes, and so on, our outputs in here. And here is your main process, and we've split the process up into the key unit operations in there. So that's the way we managed the key design decisions across the mine. Um, uh, when we looked at this, we came across uh, some interesting literature around a four-phase model that had been used for quality function deployment. Um, and it um, got us thinking about how to actually design for the stakeholder value concerns and how they may change over different life cycle considerations of an operation. So we have, have suggested what we call a, a four phase life of mine model, where we start with the reserves definition here and identifying our main value drivers. And this is really about identifying what the, the value drivers are for each of the stakeholders and prioritizing those identifying right at the start the go and the no-go issues, okay? And what parts of the the resource um, are going to be go or no-go? And that leads us to certain modifying factors to modify the resource model through here. We then come down to the design stage. Uh, and essentially we're looking at, you know, what do we need to design to? What are the stakeholder values? How are we going to design those? What's the degree of fit? 
And we'll come up with a number of mind design modifying factors, okay, that again may modify the resource model. In operations, again, this is where we're looking at sequence, scheduling, cover grade, life of mine plan. Again, we're going to come up with a, a number of limitations and again, some life of mine modifying factors to the resource model. And then finally, we have our end of life plan, our phase out, and that will again impose uh, some factors on the, uh, some restrictive factors or on the, the resource model. We think this is an interesting model to look at jolt code modification. So we're aware that there are discussions in a working group looking at, at how you incorporate ESG variables into uh, reserve um, the resource models. Um, this is an interesting framework. So here's a, an example of a practical implement, implementation. So as, as Micah mentioned, we worked with Mining3. Uh, why? Because they had a reach into um, South America for us. So we actually looked at a South American operation here. Um, we, it's a, a real case study in there. So what we've done is, we, as I mentioned, the, the degree of complexity, the, <laughs> the dimensionality of the matrix rapidly grew out of control. So we actually had to focus on what we considered to be critical uh, stakeholder uh, concerns and critical design decisions. Uh, there's a heat map in there that's basically reflecting the degree of fit of the different design solutions. And although we haven't connected the dots, uh, again, you can look at the comparison of different alternatives. So I know that it's way too small to see anything there. Um, we did use a, an, an off-the-shelf available uh, Excel solution for, for mapping this process. Okay, So we learned a few things <laughs> from that. We learned about complexity. Um, how might you display this in a useful way? Um, in the design process, you are dealing with multi-criteria decisions. What we have seen in some mining companies is a, an attempt to try to, to uh, collapse down these complex decisions into a, a single NPV or value at stake. And that's reflected in the De Beers model earlier on. We don't think that can be done because you're dealing with multi-criterion decisions. As a, as a, just as an indication, this is a, a hypothetical case here where we're looking at our eight major stakeholders, for example. There's two different solutions uh, or design scenarios we're analysing here. Design, the first one, option A, is uh, inferior in terms of uh, the outcomes for Indigenous peoples, for example, but it's slightly superior in for the shareholders, perhaps for the net present value. Okay. Option B gives you uh, much superior solutions for the Indigenous peoples in here, but um, perhaps slightly inferior NPV. This is the sort of discussion that you need to have around a, a boardroom, okay, around the complexities of which option to, to go for. So uh, essentially we're proposing something similar to a radar graph as a way of analysing the, the impact for different stakeholders. So after... Um, Apply, looking at the, the applied structure of the um, House of, of ESG, um, we looked uh, at different aspects of, of research projects. So if we're going to try to apply this framework, what are the, the main areas? There were several areas uh, that came out of it, and I'll just go through these, the next couple of slides. In terms of looking at stakeholder concerns. We want to know what the concerns are, what happens when stakeholder concern, opinion is split, when we see um, non-uniform opinion uh, in different stakeholder groups. How do we balance local, regional, national concerns? What does meaningful participation even look like? And I know that there's research work going on in SMI in that area. Um, how do we ensure uh, ongoing consultation? How do we communicate? How do we as mining companies perhaps <laughs> communicate complex decisions? Um, and the, the whole issue of, of trust is at the, the heart of those, those issues. So again, there's some interesting research work going on in, in SMI about how do we win trust? How do we regain, retain trust? What happens if we lose trust uh, here? Uh, this next section is around prioritising those uh, stakeholder values. So, uh, how do we how do we correctly document the concerns, stakeholder concerns? How do we measure them? Um, how do we project what will happen to those social concerns over the life of mine? Um, you know, are samples statistically significant in there? Uh, 
uh, what threshold values should we uh, apply to, to, to treating value to data? Um, how do we treat outliers, et cetera, uh, and some of the research questions there. Across the top in the design solutions, uh, so there's a big question, have we adequately explored all possible conceptual solutions? Um, at the moment, there's a school of thought that says that many designers actually offer uh, uh, a higher, a, a fairly blinkered approach uh, and that we're not potentially exploring um, some effective solutions there. How can we de-risk novel solutions? How can we stress effectively stress test solutions for stakeholders? Is there a solutions library? You know, could you dial in and actually have a look at prior practice and what works where <laughs> that might help your design process? And um, can we re-articulate what we're doing today in the face of changing legislation and public acceptance? So what was acceptable yesterday is perhaps no longer acceptable today. Uh, in terms of, of this area, how do we assess the, the fit of the technology with stakeholder concerns? Again, some really interesting research work happening in SMI, particularly out of swimming mm -hmm. in this area around, around uh, water uh, usage in, the, in, in Chile, for example, that we're seeing. Uh, what are the, what's the trigger point to reevaluate the design if stakeholder concerns change? Um, the top side in here, uh, helps us with, with analysing whether we treat something as part of the objective function or as a constraint in here. So questions around this, can we build models um, to optimise competing objective functions? There's some interesting work going on around Pareto front optimization. So we were just talking about Dan Hastings' work there. Micah also has some work going on around uh, evaluating uh, Pareto fronts uh, there. And then the big one there, how do we build modifying factors into reserve models? And I think Jork is still wrestling with that, with that issue uh, there. Uh, in the, the trade-off area, the house in there, so how do we best trade off technical solutions? So we're going to have trade-offs between design and operation, between operation and end of life, and between design and end of life. You know, it all adds complexity to this, to this matrix in here. Um, there is a need to develop stakeholders NFI, uh, it's net footprint index. So that's what we, we graphed in the, the little radar graph that I showed you previously in there. Um, one of the solutions that was suggested by Mining3 is the use of bow tie analyses, which is looking at risks. So when we, when we uh, look at these trade-offs, we're looking at benefit cost risk based uh, trade-off decisions. Uh, okay, so the last part is, uh, second last part, adequacy of design. So again, how do we calculate the net footprint impact for each stakeholder? How do we reduce the dimensionality? Because at the heart of this, this is a multi-dimensional problem. And we're trying to make decisions by actually collapsing those dimensions. Okay, so what makes, what's the, the right granulometry for making those decisions? And then uh, how do we communicate with stakeholders regarding the benefit, cost, and risk of alternative decision solutions. Um, it's another area of interesting research. The last part is how do we assess the feasibility of tech solutions um, and the relative importance of the technical solutions to the project? So there's a whole suite of, of work <laughs> that comes out as a result of the applications. I'm going to jump over these ones because we, we categorised these um, into four different areas. And the, the ultimate part was the four areas were around measurement, it was around models, it was around what we called alignment in here, and it was around trade-offs in here. So we identified some projects that would take priority to one to three year framework, some that would be midterm related projects, three to five. And as Micah has already alluded to, um, we have built this into the proposal for part of the, the extraction program area for the copper for tomorrow. Um, the CRC, should that be successful? So we'll know in, I think, early December if, if that bid gets up. Um, we put those onto a nice map in here, uh, which basically showed your near field research projects um, and your, your, your mid field research projects going through there. Um, and I won't go through that in the detail. So just in conclusion, um, how does the House of ESG framework help? Um, well, we listed seven key elements in here. So number one, it helps organise complex planning activities 
around multiple ESG targets. Second, it really helps you identify priority ESG risks and, and opportunities um, and maintain clear line of sight of those across the design and, and operations process. Um, it helps assess the adequacy of design solutions against those ESG targets. Um, sorry, I jumped ahead of myself there because there's the line of sight one in there. Uh, it also helps to align multiple stakeholders and our observations is that even within large mining houses, <laughs> you have a fight over who's accountable for sustainability outcomes. <laughs> so so these, uh, this sort of framework can actually really help align um, different stakeholders involved in the ESG process, uh, both within internally and externally of the mining house. Um, it clearly identifies the significant design trade-offs that need to be made in here. And lastly, we think that this is a really interesting methodology for communicating complex design decisions through to, to stakeholders. It's, it's not rocket science what we've presented. <laughs> it is uh, a neat way to summarise a lot of the decision making that happens in early stage mine planning. Okay, so Michael and I will be very happy to take any questions that you might have. We have a question from Mark Nope. Yeah, thanks, uh, Peter. Thanks, uh, Mika. So, um, look, it's, it, I, I think it's a really useful and practical uh, framework because over the last couple of years, we've had that discussion of the importance of uh, ESG and planning for closure from the very beginning. And the discrepancy I've seen is the how to. How do we consider it? And having a framework that is actually workable, as you say, communicable, uh, where are we, what are we doing, what are we considering, et cetera, seems to me uh, just perfect timing, um, you know, to, to push out if there's nothing else already there, because I've not seen anything else there. And um, just on that, you mentioned uh, the JORC and the JORC code a few times. The other... Um, reporting jurisdiction is South Africa and the SAM codes, and uh, they actually have something called SAM ESG. So basically a regulation around discussing specifically ESG. So they have uh, SAM REC, which is similar to JORC, and SAM VAL, which is similar to the Valman here, but they currently undergoing a practical review of that SAM ESG and SAM REC. And uh, we can, I can talk to you about some of the contacts there because um, presenting this as a framework into their guideline, which is now leapfrogging uh, the JORC update, might be really useful. We uh, we have a question from online as well, um, from Andy Reynolds. Uh, his question is, given that the incumbent design process is essentially driven by investors and the regulations that protect them, have you found any appetite among investors for this advanced approach? So the long and the short of that is that I don't think, we haven't spoken to investors. Um, we started this work uh, with a large, in working in conjunction with a large mining house. Um, we are in the process of writing a paper to socialise this this work. Uh, so it's it's too early in the process to um, respond to that that question. We, we'd like to see what investor response is to this framework. Hello, good morning. Um, I, uh, I'm new to Australia, but I have experience in mine planning in the Philippines and project development. And uh, the framework is ideally before you implement decisions, but I've also had experience where, for example, in a mine, we started operating open pit, but then we transitioned uh, midway to um, underground block caving, which obviously is a different um, risks involved. So how, how often do you suggest to implement or revise the House of ESG? Because, because obviously if you change in between the risks change and the House of ESG change, so um, do you recommend like um, 
certain time where your time frame where you revise the house of ESG or You know, to look at a transition to underground is actually a, a major mining project. <laughs> so, so this feeds into the early stage, uh, you know, order of magnitude and fees study into the transition to the underground because you would have you would have looked at different options for that uh, that transition. I think it's kind of a follow up from the the question that actually we had. So, first of all, this was very great talk. I, I really enjoyed and my mind gone too many places to, to get some ideas. I mean, uh, the framework all, all obviously is a kind of a static framework. So you're not essentially looking into evolution over the time as well, because there is a dynamic aspects into many of these uh, points. Like for instance, the changes in legislations, changes that happens in technology, as we discussed, like the perception of the society might evolve as well. Uh, that's one aspect, but the other aspect that I'm keen to see how we can incorporate is we kind of uh, bound ourselves around the technological solution with what we know it's already available and we can use it. But what about the potential, which essentially kind of guides those technological innovation and technological solution that actually can, can address those risks or essentially the values that essentially stakeholders they require which then it can actually help us to move to other direction in terms of, okay, how we need to develop those novel technologies or new technologies or new solutions that then map into that risk. Do you see any pathway that actually we can start incorporating that as well? And, and that's not only about the technology, I'm more thinking about like having even regulations because you've got government there and you've got society there as well. And also how you would, develop expectation or manage expectations as well so those are the things that actually if we are kind of creating an, a, a, a kind of a blank canvas if you like and say these are the values this is how we can see that actually we want to de uh, deliver to our uh, stakeholders but what is required from each of these stuff to be able to to uh, address that um that's a that's a, a really interesting question and just as a, a practical example for that I'll, I'll go back to a little bit of what we were discussing yesterday which was electrification options uh, or decarbonization options for um, large surface mining trucks it's still a very evolving field at the moment so if you're designing a mine now <laughs> that is going to come on stream in five years time you know what technologies are going to be available that are mature enough for you to actually be able to invest in to decarbonize your haulage process in there? Um, at the moment, it's associated with very high technical and operational and logistics risk. Okay, so I think what the, the House of ESG helps you to define is what are the, the design criteria that that new technology needs to satisfy in order to be acceptable? So in other words, you're providing some um, customer specifications and, and um, definitions into what the technology must um, uh, match in order to be acceptable. So it's acceptability criteria is what I'm trying to say uh, there. Uh, but, but really interesting, interesting question. You, have you got anything to add to that? <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Oh, I, 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 I've got a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, a lot of these ESG risks um, strikes me that from a corporate perspective, the risk isn't on the project that you're looking at. The risk is on the next project and the one after that in terms of, say, reputational risk damage, uh, access to capital, permitting, all of these sort of things. And there's this, that there will be within the project, if, if these risks uh, eventuate into issues, um, it, it would, there will be costs to the project, but they won't be the main ongoing cost to the company. Do you think there's a way to incorporate those sort of long-term impacts uh, in these kind of studies? So, so the framework we've put up here is on a an asset basis at the moment, which is a mine, a mine site or a greenfield type project. What you're looking at is a portfolio type analysis, which is how does that risk affect my entire portfolio? So uh, I agreed that you know corporate reputation and, and finance is is a huge area in there. So I would see cascading house of house of ESGs. So one that might be at corporate portfolio level and others that are at mine site level is a way of dealing with that complexity. So thank you. Uh, uh, th thanks, really good one. So uh, I mentioned that Sam ESG, the South African, I was sitting through a presentation from them just two days ago on where they were going and that was clear to me as well. Some of the ESG factors they were talking about to report at a project level to me were at a corporate level. So, um, you know, I think identifying what is at a corporate level from a reporting consideration and then taking how that impacts your project um, might be an interesting way to consider some of those inputs as to whether they're corporate or project level. And if they're project level, they are, they are spin off from a corporate level. But um, for a project to be reporting the corporate level topics when they're reporting on their project seems to me a disconnect or a duplication. The corporate should be reported as corporate with the impact on project as opposed to project reporting on corporate. We do have a few more online questions coming in. Um, I'll just take it online. Uh, we have a question from uh, Leandro Fagundes, who asks, in your opinion, how the House of ESG works for mining, A, critical minerals, uh, energy transition times B, common commodities, i.g. iron, coal, is it the same way, is it the same way or different way of implementation? Um, Is your microphone on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll do. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's on. Yeah. Uh, apologies. Sorry. Our apologies to the folks online. Oh yeah, that's on now. Yeah. Um. Very good. Uh. more exercise than usual today. Hi, good morning. Um, I love the framework because it's uh, it's it's going to be very usable, especially for high level decision makers, right? But I'm my question is more about the process. 
because I see the matrix, um, but it's kind of small, so I can't really see everything. So in the matrix, I see there are numbers assigned uh, uh, from the uh, intersection of the X and Y axis, right? Uh, those numbers, are those like, uh, the same as how we do uh, risk assessments using risk matrices, or is there a more quantitative uh, analysis involved in assigning those numbers? <laughs> You're going to be really fit at the end of this. Um, so these numbers, you're looking at that area in the middle, which is around impact assessment. Um, at the moment, the way that the, the quality function deployment works, it's a qualitative assessment as to how well the designs, particular design solution fits the stakeholder concern. This is an area where there is a need for, for future research um, because it's not necessarily very evident sometimes how <laughs> what the, I mean I, I don't like relying on a qualitative evaluation I think that there's a need to develop some structured decision making criteria in here to be able to assign uh, an index which gives you the degree of fit for that design solution against a particular criteria uh, and essentially it's when you when you think about it it's a relative number because it's relative to the other design solutions that you're dealing with again that's that's more phd territory in there and there's a lot of work to be done in that area we have some more questions online um jenny agnew, agnew asks uh, could the process be used to identify sensitivity of decisions and outcomes to different regulatory settings e.g closure liability and transition to next land use. Uh, yes, I think it could actually be quite useful there because it would give you a graphical indication because you're looking at, um, again, evaluating multiple alternatives and how well the design solutions will fit when your stakeholder concerns change. So essentially, what when you change legislation, you're looking at change stakeholder concerns in there. Um, so yes, being able to um, evaluate different options and how well they fit uh, the different legislative requirements is, is an interesting proposition. Uh, one more question as well. Have you looked into um, causal network topology analysis, the sort of stuff that Ben Seligman is doing here at the SMI uh, as a as a, to be potentially incorporated into this house of ESG, or I saw you mentioned bow tie analysis as a way of developing things, and the causal network stuff is like multi dimensional bow ties. But uh, have you looked at that? No, but we'd be interested to know more about it. <laughs> I think the two points that I wanted to make was. First was about, like, as you mentioned as well, like mining projects, the problem that we have is when we design the mine and we design the plan, we stuck with that for, for a long time. And how well they are suited for future advances, I think is going to be interesting to put as one of the criteria in terms of like, when you have the mine design, then how well is adaptable to potential changes in the future? And also same with the plan, because like in one of the conferences I was talking, the engineering firm, I said, have you considered in terms of things that you need to do for some of these new plants that you're designing to be suitable for robots, which is say, oh, we don't see the robots coming very soon. And we know that actually they're going to happen very soon as well. So, and those plants, they're going to last for 30 years, 50 years. I think that's something that actually, I'm not sure how well we can connect it. The other one actually, that the point that you mentioned at the end was, uh, and I think I'm the same page as you, probably having series of questions for those essentially vertical columns that actually you have the technical solutions that then experts can answer. And then by combining that, uh, the, those combined answers that you got from the experts, you can actually start essentially putting a kind of, kind of a qualitative, uh, uh, quantitative value for each of the value drivers might be interesting at, uh, approach as well. So you're not relying on one number, but you essentially aggregate num uh, the answer to number of questions that is answered by 
expert, which then can aggregate that as well. The, the other point I would I would also make, just following on from, from what you were saying, Mason, is you know, under each of these cells, when you look at degree of fit, there's actually a whole management plan that sits in there. So if I put uh, a SAG mill in there and I'm looking at energy efficiency and how well it matches the emissions criteria, that's a whole uh, impact study in, in there. So so this acts as a, a template, you know, to be able to access uh, the, the detailed uh, stakeholder management plans that you might have around different aspects of technology. Oh, and, and just going back to your question about suitability of future technology, um, that really comes down to robust mine plans looking at technology options in the future and leaving pathways available to move towards those. So classic case of that is um, mines that start off as truck shovel operations and we use you know, circular pits and so on, then all of a sudden you might want to change to using an in-pit crushing conveyor and you find that your mine plant's not at all suited to a, a conveyor system in there because you've locked that option off. Um, so, yeah, I, I do understand where your question comes from. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. That's all we have time for today. If you could all join me in thanking Michael and Peter. Please uh, join us again next week. We have Professor Don McKee coming and talking about the early days of the JKM, uh, JK Tech setup. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>